morning. Good morning for those who are watching us online. Good morning wherever you are across our city. Great to have you with us. Amen. Good morning. Do you know what? It's so good to see you. There's no better place than being in the house of God on a Sunday. Come Amen. on. Amen. Online. Amen. Fist pump. <laughs> so let's get ready to worship. Our hearts are open. Let's go worship team. Amen. Bless you guys. Bless you. Come on, let's clap our hands, church. All together.
Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is.
trust in you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we glorify your name, oh God. We glorify your name. Let's continue worshiping, church. As past away, your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the
I know your love surrounds us We'll never be alone Take us to your court yes, Where we will see start you again would you feel us would you feel us show us your glory oh, the only thing we want is you Let's sing together. Feel us again. Feel us again. Feel us again. Make us overflow. Make us overflow. Let's this be a church, a corporate worship. Feel us again. again make us overflow make us overflow make us overflow let's ask for it feel us again feel us again overflow let's sing it one more time feed us feed us again feed us again send your spirit make us overflow make us overflow Lord, this is the confession of our heart. We love you. We adore you. We worship you. Lord, let our be worship like that of this woman whose story this song tells, where we can say our affection, our devotion is poured out upon the feet of Jesus. What an incredible story of a woman so intent on worshiping Jesus, she did not care what it cost. She didn't care what it cost her in monetary terms. She didn't care what it cost her reputation. She didn't care what it cost for the perception of her in the room. We have this image of a woman pouring perfume upon Jesus wetting his feet with 
her tears and kissing his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. A show of worship so extravagant as to shame her. But she knew Jesus was worthy of that worship. Lord, would you give us the same heart of worship, God, that we would worship you with everything we have, with everything we are, no matter what it costs us, no matter what it costs our reputation. Help us to worship you fully and completely with our whole lives, oh God. Because Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Church, there's a couple of different things going on both in our nation and around the world that we felt was appropriate to lift up in prayer together at this time. So we know that we have the situation in Haiti where there's been an earthquake. We have the situation in Afghanistan where it seems so many people are being hurt, killed, injured again. And then we have the situation on our own shores in Plymouth with the shooting in Plymouth and at times like this, there's so much heartache, so much heartbreak in the world. It, 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 sometimes it's hard to know how to respond, but one thing we do know how to do, church, is we know how to pray. We know how to lift it up to God. So why don't we just, I invite you, why don't we just lift our hands in this place right now and lift these situations up to God. Lord, you know these situations intimately, deeply. You know the ins and outs of them, God, in a way that we never could. And we know that even in the darkest of places, at the darkest of times, Lord, you are still at work in the midst of these things. You are still at work in the midst of these places. We know, God, that your heart is for the marginalized. Your heart is for the weary. Your heart is for the broken and the meek. Your heart is for the oppressed. Your heart is for the foreigner and for the refugee, O oh God. We know that all of these situations capture your heart, oh God. And we pray that you would just pour out your presence, pour out your spirit. Where comfort is needed, would you bring com comfort? Where peace is needed, would you bring peace? Where justice is needed, would you bring justice, oh God? And in all of these situations, Lord, we ask, we pray, we appeal to you, would your will be done? Would your will be done? And Lord, if, if there needs to be a response from us, if there's anything we need to do as a church or as individuals, God, would you just make us aware and let us know. Help us walk in step with you, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, good morning, BCC. It's so good to see you today. Why don't you turn around and wave at somebody? So, isn't it so good to be back in church? just to be back together, to be gathered. And uh, we're going to have a video now from Leon, and he's going to give us our big ministry why for his particular ministry. So yes, by all means, please take your seats, be comfortable, and let's watch the screens. Thank you. My name is Leon and I manage our amazing Birmingham Central Food Bank. And the reason why I do this is because of the great love that God has for us all. God loves us. He loves you. He loves your family. He loves your mother-in-law. He loves your neighbors. He loves us all with an everlasting love. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible says, it's God's perfect love that casts fear out of our life. God's love for us is pure, perfect, and unconditional. And he loves us no matter where we find ourselves in life. At the food bank, we meet people from all walks of life, from people who've been stuck in a cycle of poverty for years, to people who are visiting us for the first time, wondering how they ever ended up at a food bank, often coming in feeling rejected, ashamed, with their heads held down. But we want them to know that God knows them and loves them no matter what. So when we serve at the food bank, we do so with a Christ-compelled love. So if people are feeling unknown, they have a sense that God knows them. If they're feeling unloved, they have a sense that God loves them. If they're feeling rejected and insignificant, 
they'll come to know that God accepts them and has a plan and purpose for their life. That is the reason why I lead the food bank, in hope that as we serve the vulnerable in our city, they will come to encounter the great love of God. So if you too have a heart for the vulnerable and a desire to see people come to know the great love of Christ, why don't you join us at Birmingham Central Food Bank? If you can spare a couple of hours on a Tuesday or Friday morning once a month, send us an email to admin at bcc.life. God bless you all. You are loved. Oh, God bless you, BCC. Do you know, I don't know about you, but I'm already feeling blessed already. We haven't got to the message yet. This is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. Um, as we go into our tithing section, I just wanted to share with you a verse. Um, it's from Malachi 3, verses 10. It's like from the NIV, and it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be um, food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Okay, so I've got a short testimony in that nine years ago, um, my firstborn daughter was born, amazing. Um, after a year, reality hit and we had to put her into nursery because we couldn't afford um, everything. Um, it got really tight, if I'm honest with you. Um, it got really tight, so I was, at the time, kind of living in my overdraft. Um, it got so bad I had to sell my car you know, I'd sell my car, and I was living in Coventry at the, at the time as well, and things were just really tough. And I remember it was, um, it was in December, actually, and uh, it was snowing, and I was walking home, and um, I had to catch a train and a bus and then walk home, and it was snowing, and I was slipping around, and I was like, God, this is ridiculous. I'm in my 30s, but I can't even afford a car. By the time I get home, because the train's delayed, I'm going to miss out my daughter seeing me, and I thought, this can't continue. And I remember moving on um, a couple of years after that, Pastor Paula, um, she gave a message which talked about tithing, and it was about um, your obedience in tithing, because we know it's a commandment, but also your faith in tithing, and to probably try and give a bit more. And I wrestled with this because I was like, well, Pastor Paolo, you don't know my circumstance. I'm kind of broke at the moment, you know, it's, it's tough. You know, but um, it wrestled with me, it stayed with me, and um, I cut back on certain things, I gave a bit more. And just to fast forward, um, we're in a much different place now, and it's all because of God's blessing. Um, I made a couple of points of what's happened, so um, bear with me. Um, so, since we um, gave a bit more, number one, um, my wife could work part-time, she couldn't do that before, it was really on her heart, she wanted to spend more time with her daughters. Um, number two, I've had two jobs since. I've not had to go for an interview, I was headhunted, which is amazing. Um, number three, when I had no car, and I was walking, I was like, God, this is ridiculous, what's going on here? Ever since, I've had two jobs, I've had two company cars. And I'm not doing this to gloat, I'm just to show you how God has blessed us as a family. Um, number four, whilst I was living in my overdraft for the longest time, I haven't been in my overdraft for about six or seven years. Uh, yeah, please, come on, join me, this is amazing. And number five, you know, Coventry, it's a bit of a, a, bit of a bot for me, and I've, I've worked no, um, further away than half an hour from my home ever since, and that's all because of God's blessing. And I say this because, what I want for my family, what I want for my wife, my kids, is what I want for you. I'm not just saying this, you're my brothers and my sisters. So I encourage you guys to tithe. And if you've got it a bit as well, if you do a bit more, give a bit more because God's abundance is amazing and it's worked for me. And that is my testimony to you. And with that, as you give your tithes, I'm gonna ask the media, to media team to put on the QR code at the back. Please, if you could, um, to allow you to pay your tithes online. But also, if you've got physical cash, physical offering, there's some black boxes at the back um, to do that as well. And as you do that, I just want to say a prayer um, over my family, which is you guys. Um, dear Lord God, I thank you for this moment. I thank you, Lord God, for your provision. Um, we are your children. We believe that. We believe in every word that you say. You say, test me. Um, so, Lord God, I pray for every single person here in this room, but also for those online. Lord God, that we can increase our faith, that we can test you in certain situations, Lord God, because we know you will always be there and you will always be ready to bless us. Amen. Amen. As in, before I go hand over to Pastor Nick via video link for more announcements, um, I'm going to release all our children from year, ages of year three to year six um, onto children's ministry, so if they can, they can go now. Um, and yeah, media team, if you could play the video, please, that'd be great. God bless you guys. God bless you.
Hey BCC, it's Pastor Nick here. I hope you're having a great summer. I just wanted to let you know about three things. August Bank Holiday Sunday, we are hosting Family Festival again. We want you to come in your national dress. We're going to be having a celebratory time of worship and uh, celebration of all of who we are as a church. We have 90 nationalities here at BCC. Um, we're going to be having a special guest, Linda Heron from the Dare Ministry over at Elim in Northampton is coming and bringing a special message in the final part of our Encounters with Jesus series. Uh, we've got some games in the service, uh, some fun stuff happening, some special prayers being read. Um, so really, really want to encourage you to come to that. Straight after the service in our cafe, it will be possible to buy some lunch, hot dogs, samosas, spring rolls. Our tuck shop will be open uh, or you can bring a packed lunch. And then straight after that, we are going to do some baptisms in the car park. You won't don't want to miss out on it. It's just promising to be such a great occasion. Two more things to say. I hope that you are able to join us for our prayer live stream on Tuesday night at half past seven. Send your prayer requests in to admin at bcc.life or jump onto YouTube or Facebook and put your requests in live. We would be delighted to pray for you. We are maintaining our prayer live stream every Tuesday night all the way through August uh, in, and into September. And the final thing I just want to say to you is that uh, please do keep on reading our Summer in the Psalms devotions that we have been creating for you uh, as a team. Uh, you'll notice that different members of our team have been putting those uh, devotions together for you and the feedback we've been having from you is that you are receiving them really, really well. I am delighted with the content in there. There's some absolute gems coming through from the team. Um, it's so easy to get a little bit disconnected from God during the summer, but the Summer in the Psalms devotions helps you stay on track. So BCC, uh, keep connected. Do come to Family Festival on August Bank Holiday Sunday and keep on connecting with our prayer live streams on Tuesday nights. And we'll see you soon. Well, good morning, BCC. Good morning, good morning. Good morning to those of you joining us online and good morning to those of you here in the building with us. Wow, isn't it so good to be in church today? Oh, come on now. Isn't it so good to be in church today? Thank you. That's it. You weren't sure for a minute there, but that's all right. Um, so the message that I'm going to bring you today is up on the screen. The title of it is called Jesus and Peter, the moment of truth. But before we get into that, I just want to ask a question. Has anybody ever played the game 20 Questions? Yeah. yeah. Put your hand up if you've played the game 20 Questions. Okay, so I think most people have. It's probably a game that you've maybe played at a party or at a, you know, like a camping trip or, or something. Um, and the basic premise of the game is this. Somebody chooses a famous person. So, um, say I could choose Marcus Rashford. And the job of everyone else in the game is to try and guess who that is, and hence the name, 20 questions. They get to question you about who your person is and try and figure out who it is. Now, there is a catch. You can't just go, who is it? <laughs> you can only ask questions that can be answered by yes or no, and it's like a process of elimination to figure out who it is. So with Marcus Rashford, for example, somebody might say, is he sorry, is he, is it a man? And I go, yes, it's a man. And they could also say, um, are they an actor? And I go, no, they're not an actor. Are they a sports person? Yes, they're a sports person. Um, do they play football? Yes, they play football. Do they play for England? Yes. And then people will start to go, oh, I think I know who this is. And they go, did he feed thousands of school children last year during the pandemic? And I would say, I think you're on to me, yes. And then you'd say, is it Marcus Rashford? And you will have won the game. Now, I think we should play a little bit of 20 questions here together this morning. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Except we're not going to just choose any ordinary famous person. We're going to choose a character from the Bible. So I've got a character from the Bible in my mind, and I am ready, ladies and gentlemen, for my first question. Are Yes. You can't say male or female because I can only say yes or no. Are they male or female? Yes and no. <laughs> so the first question I had there from Natalie, are they a man? Yes, it's a man. Are they in the New Testament? Are they in the New Testament? Yes, they're in the New Testament. 
Are they a disciple? Ooh, two people at the same time. Yes, they are a disciple, but I will say as a little hint to you, depends on how broad your definition of disciple is. Is he one of the 12? No. He is. Yes! Is it Paul? Yes, it is Paul, the Apostle Paul. Woo, man, I gotta tell you, that could have went really wrong. <laughs> and it's good to know that my, my biblical knowledge stands up at least to some light questioning, even if it's just a pre-existing answer. I'm like, oh Lord, please help them not ask something about Paul I don't know. <laughs> you may have played another version of the same game with the post-it notes. Has anybody played that where you put the post-it note on your head and everybody has a go at the same time? And you, the thing about that though is you don't get to choose who your person is. It gets chosen for you. So I could be playing a game with the staff team and I go, right, I'm going to give somebody a really hard one that they won't know. And I have been stuck walking around parties and get-togethers not having a clue who's written on a post-it note on my forehead. And I've learned some things about myself, church. It's been a very learning process. I've learned that I know very little about Justin Bieber. Very little. <laughs> I've learned that I don't know the difference really to my ear between grime and gas music. I don't know. You guys, you're going to have to help me. And also what I've learned is my knowledge of geography, particularly British geography, is so poor that honestly we need to give thanks to God that I even made it here today. Like, <laughs> honestly, honestly, I don't even know where I live. Like, people are always laughing at me when I'm talking about, I don't know where Birmingham is. I know London is that way, and I know Scotland is that way. And that's all I know. So hey, we're having some fun here. <laughs> but the questions that get asked in the Game 20 questions, whether you play the post-it note version or the original version that we played, it's all about identity. And it's all a way of testing your knowledge to see how much you know about a particular person, a particular famous person. And in this message, in this scripture that we're going to look at today, we're going to see that Jesus actually has a couple of questions for his disciples as well about who he is. Except he's not messing around. It's not a game. And he's only got two questions. So I think my mic is playing up. So somebody's going to help me with that. I'm just going to keep going. Um, so the scripture that we're going to read from is Matthew 16. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version from verse 13. So Matthew 16, 13 onwards. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven also." Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, I think I'm going to switch microphones. That's not what Jesus said. Okay, you're switching. You're going to switch this one off. Cool. <laughs> Peter took him to a side and said, I'm going to switch microphones. No. Um, sorry, from verse 22. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Before we get into the message, why don't we just pray together just about this word. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather around your word today. Would you give us fresh revelation, fresh insight, and may we depart from today feeling like we know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is a key moment in the earthly mission of Jesus, and a really key moment when it comes to his relationship with the disciples. A little bit of context, 
at this point, Jesus' time on earth with the 12, with all of us, but especially with the 12, is coming to an end. So if you look through the scriptures leading up to this conversation, you'll see time and time again that Jesus has an urgency to the way he speaks that would let you know that he realizes his time with his followers is running out. It's, it's running slow. And the issue of who they think he is is very much pressing on his heart. To give a little bit more context, they're in the district of, in the city, sorry, of Caesarea Philippi or Caesarea Philippi, depending on your pronunciation. And this is a city in the northern part of Israel. It is a Gentile city, which means that it is not one that is full of Jewish people, people of Israel, believers. It's mostly full of people that have some connection or are members or citizens of the Roman Empire. So it's often thought that Jesus has used this time to take his followers away from the baying crowds and the people that have been following him from place to place, the people that have been gathering on hilltops and in wide open spaces to hear Jesus preach, and that he's taken them away from that place in order to finalize their preparation for all that will come to pass, everything that will happen in the weeks and months to come and all that will happen after Jesus goes to Jerusalem and completes the work that he came to this earth to do. So the truth is, within a few chapters, you will see that they start, within a few chapters, traveling south again, across the Jordan and towards Jerusalem. And you will see that it is a journey from which there's no turning back. So it's very clear at this point that Jesus realizes that time is of the essence. And this is really weighing on his heart. Identity and the issue of the, the disciples understanding exactly who Jesus was is the key here. If I was to give you one takeaway line, if you write down nothing else, if you remember nothing else from this message today, let it be this. That which we believe about Jesus and that which we confess about Jesus is everything. It is everything. That which we believe about Jesus and that which we confess about Jesus is everything. You still with me so far? Amen. Okay. So, we are to look upon Jesus and do everything we can in our lives, in our faith lives, in our journeys, to know him more and more and to understand him, to understand who he is and to be able to say, Jesus, I know you for who you truly are. That is the goal of our relationship with God. So I want to talk about three principles that will help us achieve this goal. Three principles to orient our life around, to orient our relationship with Christ around, so that we will have the greatest chance possible to know him as well as we possibly could, to have the most pure and complete image of Jesus in our minds and understand his character completely. So the first principle I want to give you is the principle of proximity. Now, proximity simply means closeness, nearness. My proximity to these guys here in this row here, to Karen, to Lloyd, to Luca, to Stephen, everybody here, my proximity to them is a lot nearer than my proximity to the team at the back who are mixing the sound and the cameras. My prox so it's an issue of closeness. How close are we to Jesus in our walk with him? Jesus presents an interesting comparison to the disciples, and I think it's really important that we notice it. Jesus doesn't just say, who does everybody think I am? No, he says, one, who do the people say that I am? And two, who do you, my disciples, my followers, say that I am? And he makes that distinction. Why do we think that is? I think it's because he expected them to know better. I think it's because he expected them to know him better than the crowds did. What of the crowds? Think about the people that gathered to see Jesus speak but didn't get to, to travel with him. If we were alive in the days that Jesus walked this earth, this would probably be us. There might be some fortunate ones within our number who may have been one of the 12, but for the most part, we would have been part of this crowd. And what would their experience of Jesus be? They maybe would have seen him speak. They maybe would have seen him pass through their village. 
They maybe would have had an interaction with him, maybe. Um, and they would have heard from other people what he was all about. So they didn't have no knowledge of him. They just had an incomplete knowledge of him. Now compare that to the knowledge of the disciples, of the 12, that got to live with him each and every day. What was their experience of Jesus? They got to share meals with him. They got to see him go to bed at night and wake up the next morning. They got to share conversations with him. They got to live in closeness and in intimacy with him. To go back to our 20 questions game, I am a huge Manchester United fan. Can I just confess that here in our midst? Can I just say I'm also praying for any Leeds United fans in the building after the game yesterday where we won 5-1? And some people are bad losers, but I'm also a pretty terrible winner. <laughs> but I'm a huge Manchester United fan, and we talked about Marcus Rashford earlier on in the game that we played, and I feel like I know about uh, quite a lot about Marcus Rashford. I can remember when an Anthony Martial, one of the Manchester United players, got injured just before a game in 2014, and this young kid, Marcus Rashford, who, to be honest with you, I'd never even heard of, suddenly he was going to start this game, and I thought, oh, we're never going to win now. And it was in the Europa League, and we were playing a, I think we were playing a Danish team, and he comes off the, he, he starts, we weren't expecting him to start, and, and he scores two goals, and we win the game. And then a couple of weeks later, he plays against Arsenal, and he scores another two goals. <laughs> and I've probably watched every single Manchester United game under the sun that's happened since that moment. So I feel like I know a lot about Marcus Rashford. But I'll tell you something, I probably don't know him as well as his mother does, <laughs> or his teammates, or his close friends. How different is their perception of him compared to mine? And how incomplete is my perception of him compared to theirs? Elsewhere in our game, we talked about the Apostle Paul. Now, we have all of Paul's writings. It's believed that he penned 13 books of the Bible. Um, and we have a huge library of Scripture that can help us to get to know the nature and the character of Paul quite well. But how much better would Timothy know Paul? Timothy, whom Paul mentored... Timothy, whom Paul called a spiritual son. How much deeper is Timothy's understanding of Paul? And how incomplete is ours by comparison? The truth is, when Jesus asked this question to the disciples, who do the people say that I am, and who do you say that I am? The truth is, he expected them to see him for who he truly was. Now, Proximity is something that we need to cultivate as a result in our walk with Jesus. We don't get to um, walk the earth with the bodily form of Jesus yet in the same way that the disciples did, but we can introduce elements into our walk with God to get close to Jesus, to get greater proximity with him, taking time to read the word, taking time to pray, taking time to fellowship with other believers and see God at work in their lives performing acts of mercy and justice in Jesus' name and understanding his heart and partnering in the work of the kingdom. These are all things we can do to gain greater proximity to the heart of God and understand him better. So we need proximity, that's our first principle, to understand who Jesus truly is. Amen, you with me so far? I'm going to keep asking you that just to make sure I can, you know, that you're still there. Um, our, so if our first principle is proximity, our second principle is humility. Now this is, humility is just being humble. That's a term that's thrown around a lot, but it basically means freedom from any pride, freedom from any arrogance, and we basically, we don't think that we've got everything figured out, that we're the best, we've got it all together, and we're sorted. If you don't do that, chances are you're pretty humble. And humility is not just a characteristic, but it's a relational posture, particularly when it comes to our faith, having humility in our understanding of Jesus, having humility when we approach the Word of God, having humility that we maybe haven't got it all figured out yet. We could look at Peter and say, okay, so he's just received this incredible blessing from Jesus, where Jesus has gone, blessed are you, Peter, son of Jonah, 
For this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood. This, blood. this has been revealed to you by my Father who is in heaven. And what he implies there is by the Holy Spirit. It would be easy for us to think, oh man, Peter is like on another level now to the rest of the disciples. And he's just like, he's hit it. Whatever the goal is, I don't know what it is, but he's hit it. And it could be easy to think, okay, so he's sorted now. He's just good. He's all good. And for the rest of his days, he was a very holy man who made no mistakes, no longer sinned, and all was grand. But if you know Peter's story, you know that's not what happened. You know that's not what happened. If we look at the scripture we looked at, not two, three verses later, Peter goes from, blessed are you, Simon Peter, to get behind me, Satan. That's a pretty big turnaround. Uh, the, the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says, Peter goes from being a rock to a stumbling block. <laughs> and I always think that's quite funny. I think I'd read that book or I'd watch that movie if it ever got made. Um, so what we need to be aware of is the fact that this is not beyond any of us. You know, we, we could easily be Peter. We could easily be Peter in this moment. And, and maybe we always say, like, how could you be in the presence of the living Jesus and not see him for who he truly was? But the truth is, we still do things like this every day. We just do. I know I'm not the only one here in the room who's tried to put God in a box. Okay, Lord, this is what I need. And I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> this is what I'm expecting. And if there's anything else, I will be disappointed. Or you know what the great one is? Mm, what you don't realize, Lord, is what you don't realize. God, have you considered? Have you thought about? <laughs> we all do it. We can put God in a box. The practice and principle of humility in our faith life as a measure to understand Jesus better is simply saying, I don't know everything. Lord, help me understand you more fully. Help me see you for who you truly are. And Lord, your will be done. Your will be done. There is no greater show of humility in the entire word, I think, than in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus says, if it is your will, Lord, let this whole thing, the cross, my death, my crucifixion, let it pass from me. But not my will be done, O oh God. Your will be done. And if it's good enough for Jesus, church, it's good enough for us. We need that same relational humility when it comes to our when it comes to our walk with God. It's interesting how Jesus never really talked about himself as being the Messiah. If you look through the word, he, d he doesn't use the term Messiah to refer to himself all that often. More often than not, he uses the term son of man. And I think that's because he understood the hearts of the people of Israel, and he understood the hearts of his followers in that there was a lot of baggage with the term Messiah. There was a lot of expectation. They were expecting a certain type of Messiah. They weren't expecting the gentle, humble, loving, kind Messiah who would lay down his life and be killed and turn earth and the heavens upside down and form a new kingdom where the way up is down. No, they were expecting a warrior king to come in and reclaim the throne and drive out the Roman Empire and establish a kingdom in Israel again, a seat of earthly power and everything be on the up and up again. So I think Jesus, when he said in this scripture, just after Peter proclaimed him as the Messiah, he said, yes, and that's been revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. And also, disciples, don't tell anyone that I am the Messiah. And I think it's because he knew their hearts and he knew that they weren't ready to give a full and accurate picture of who he was yet because they didn't quite yet have the humility they needed to see him for who he truly was. So our first principle is proximity. Our second principle is humility. And I think if we need more of this in our life, we just need to take a moment to examine our own heart and ask the question, what preconceived ideas of Jesus do I need to lay down? What things am I waiting on God for that he never promised me? What things did I promise God that he was going to do for me <laughs> rather than he promised me he was going to do for me? And what do we in humility need to lay down and say, okay, God, your will be done. 
First principle, proximity. Second principle, humility. Third and final principle, revelation. Now, revelation is a word that gets thrown around church a lot, but it simply means a revelation for something to be revealed to us. And in a practical sense, what it means is understanding, insight, knowledge, and wisdom that comes from God through the Holy Spirit. Proximity and humility are important, but they're not enough on their own. Look again at Jesus' words to Peter. This has been revealed to you, not by flesh and blood, but by my Father who is in heaven. And what Jesus is saying there is, the Father has revealed it, and he has revealed it by the Holy Spirit. We need to pursue revelation. And the, Holy, the, the Scripture says that the Holy Spirit performs a work of revelation in our heart when it comes to us seeing Jesus for who he truly is. One, one of the joys, actually, of being able to gather again and being able to gather again without restrictions or with decreased restrictions is that we've been able to have weddings again, which has been awesome, and we've had a bunch of people from within our church get married over the last couple of months. And actually, the most recent wedding I was at was at the wedding of our dear sister Sharon Storrid, and she got married recently to Simon, and it was just a lovely celebration. It was a lovely day, and it was lovely to be a part of it. Now, Sharon did a thing which you don't see at every wedding anymore, but I thought was really wonderful. She wore a veil as she came in. Now, I knew Sharon was getting married because people had told me it was her wedding. <laughs> and the other fella that was there was Simon, and I knew that Simon and Sharon were supposed to be getting married. So I thought to myself, that's probably Sharon under that veil. But I couldn't see her fully. Now, if I look close, if I kind of concentrated, I was like, okay, I can see that that's Sharon. I can see her face. I recognize her features. That's Sharon. I know her. She's awesome. But it wasn't until the veil was removed that we saw her fully on her wedding day, ready to marry the man that she loved and start their life together. The veil was removed, so we saw Sharon as she truly was in that moment. And the scripture says that the Holy Spirit does the same thing for us when it comes to looking at the face of Jesus. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 12 onwards, Paul writes about how the Holy Spirit reveals the full face of God to us. And he even uses the word that the veil is removed. Let me just read it to you quickly. Since we have such hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over the heart. But when one turns to the Lord, meaning Jesus, that veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and we all, all of us, with unveiled faces, can now behold the glory of God as in a mirror. And we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And all of this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul is trying to tell the church of the new covenant, that's us, that we have an opportunity to see the fullness of Jesus' face, to understand the fullness of Jesus' nature, to understand the fullness of who Jesus is in a way unlike thousands of believers from many years before. Our opportunity to see Jesus is unprecedented, and it is because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross and the ongoing work of revelation that the Holy Spirit continues in our lives day to day. Are you with me? Are you with me? Amen. So, the Holy Spirit is Jesus. The Holy Spirit is often called the Spirit of Jesus, and He dwells within us. So, if I could summarize this third principle into one thing, revelation, I would say it's like this. We need to allow Jesus to show us who Jesus is. I'll say it one more time. We need to allow Jesus to show us who Jesus is. So those are my three principles. 
Proximity, humility, revelation. This story with Peter, and in fact the whole life of Peter, I'll be honest with you, I find it really frustrating. Because on the one hand, you have somebody recognize Jesus for who he is like nobody ever before in humanity has done. And then moments later, he's completely forgotten who Jesus is. On the one hand, you could say, did anybody know Jesus better on earth? And on the other hand, you'd say, did anybody fail him more completely? And yet, his story didn't end there. We know that what happened next was they went on to the Last Supper. Peter argued with Jesus again. Jesus said, one of you will betray me. Peter said, no, we won't. And then Peter, uh, Jesus said to Peter, well, actually, Peter, you, you personally, you will deny me three times. And Peter said, I won't, I won't do it. Just a little sidebar. Don't disagree with Jesus when he tells you something. Don't be like, oh, I don't know, I think I know better. If Jesus says you're going to do this, you can kind of just go, I guess I'm going to do it. We know then that Peter went on to deny Jesus three times. And we know that Jesus was arrested, he was crucified, he was killed, he was buried. On the third day he rose again, that he walked on this earth for 40 days, and then he ascended into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And we know that his work was made complete, and we know because of all that he did that we have been given life and life in abundance. We know that we've been released into new freedom. We know that the gap between us and God has been removed and will never be put in place again. And we know that Jesus will never turn away those who approach him and say, Lord, may I enter your kingdom. So what can we learn from the story of Peter? Worship team, please, uh, please come back up. We're going to worship again in a second. I think whilst we can take his failures as a cautionary tale, we can also look at how the story ended. Because there is redemption for those who are in Christ. Amen, church? There is redemption. There is always a second chance. There is always another moment. God never gives up on us. He is always ready to use us again. All we need to be able to do is say, Lord, use me. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, look on me again. As we said in the story, Jesus stayed on earth for 40 days after he rose. He ascended into heaven. And some nine or ten days after that, we had the day of Pentecost. And for those of you who don't know the story, as was prophesied by Jesus, the Holy Spirit fell amongst the believers as they were praying in the upper room. The Holy Spirit descended on them and tongues, and tongues of fire came down from the ceiling. They began to praise and worship God. They began to speak in other languages and they spilled out into the streets and everybody thought they were drunk. And who was it but Peter that stood up and said, no. And he went on to explain and draw a line from the prophet Joel the whole way down through history, through the story of the cross, to the very moment that they found themselves in. He gave an appeal for people to repent and give their lives to Jesus. And he gave this incredible sermon in Acts chapter 2, where it was in no doubt that Peter knew who Jesus was. From the lowest of failures to the highest of victories and everything in between. There is much to be learned from Peter's story. Life is fragile. Our human condition is fragile. We will have victories, we will have defeats, but God is never finished with us. God is never finished with us. He is never, ever finished with us. In God, I just want to finish with this. In, in God, there is more love than you could ever imagine. There is more love than you could ever imagine, church. Somebody needs to hear this today. There is more love than you could ever imagine in Jesus. There is redemption. There is grace. There is mercy. There is forgiveness. And there is restoration to rebuild broken things and make them beautiful again. Jesus knows how we are. And yet he loves us completely. 
And in response, we love him and we long to know him completely. Humility, proximity, revelation. Can we stand together, please, church? I want to invite you, if you can, if it's not too much, please stand. I want us to take just a moment just to respond briefly that we're going to worship. And then once we've finished worshiping, if you're with us online, live stream, you're going to go with our online hosts and they're going to pray for you. And if you're here in the room, we're going to continue to pray for each other and to worship. If you feel like in your life, proximity with Jesus is an issue, like you, don't, you just feel far from God, you feel like, that's not me. That thing you said where somebody's really close, that's not me. I've got some proximity going on right now. But if you feel, let, let, let's just stay focused, folks. If you feel that you need to be closer to Jesus, then why not just create some time for him? Make some time in this coming week. Make any time, any time you can spare to read your word, to pray, to talk to him. You know what I do? I put my headphones in and I put some worship music on Spotify and I walk down that canal and I've discovered parts of Birmingham that I never knew existed. Discovering closeness with God is far more ordinary and more simple than you could even imagine. It's not always this big holy thing where, you know, you're like flat out on the ground interceding at 2 a.m. in the morning. Often it's just in the ordinary simple ways, music in your car on your drive to work taking a deep breath and just saying, Lord, I'm here, help me. There is proximity for believers. There's humility. If you need humility in response to this message, you think I need to work on my humility. Take a moment to be intentional and see if there's somebody you can learn from. Somebody who's maybe a little further along in the faith than you and say, hey, what have you learned about Jesus in your time of faith that you can tell me about? Or maybe it needs to be a physical act of serving somebody in a way that costs you. And just ask the Holy Spirit to cultivate that humility. And then if you need revelation, this is a simple one. Open your Bible. Open your Bible. Read through your word. Forget all of the guilt. Forget all of the stuff that keeps us away from the word of God. Oh, I haven't read my Bible all week, so uh, just open the word, church and ask the Holy Spirit to give you fresh eyes because it is a living word written by a living God for a living faith and there is fresh mercy in it for today. We're going to worship. We're going to sing Jesus We Love You again because that is just the most appropriate song for this moment. And then after we worship, I'm going to come back. And if you're in the room, we're going to do some ministry time here. If you're on the live stream, we're going to hand you over to our online hosts. But let us worship together, church. Amen. You are 
I don't know about you, but that service was amazing. Oh, it just it, it hit. Was lovely. It hit the spot. Can I just encourage you know, like people online? Actually, if you're, you know, if you can come in, I know the spirit of the Lord is in your home, at your office place, wherever yeah. you are right now. But there was something about being in the house of God with people as well. So yeah. it was just amazing. When that song, Jesus, we love you. Yeah. You felt it. Yeah. You felt it. Yeah. It's amazing. We're going to just quickly recap what Kevin spoke about. So the, th the three principles. So the first one being proximity and how we how close we are with Jesus. And for me, um, one thing that Kevin said was about let's not make things deep and ritualistic. It's about just yeah. finding that time. We always think, oh, I don't have time to read the Bible. Um, I mean, I'm I'm trying to do my streaks, but sometimes I fall off. But one thing he said oh, was about yeah. was about sort yeah, of yeah. just finding time to worship, and even just means blasting that word worship music in the house and just being close with God. Mm. I felt that was really powerful. That really spoke Amen. to me. Amen. Amen. Even with the humility as well. Yeah. So sometimes, I mean, I've never felt like I've ever arrived, but sometimes you feel like you know a bit more than you do. Yeah. Sometimes you do it just to make yourself feel more confident with yourself, but actually just be real with yourself, be real mm. with people. Um, one thing I found really helped me as well is to to acknowledge to people that I don't know everything and I need help sometimes. Yeah. You know, so um, that really spoke to me in the humility part as well. And, the re and finally, revelation, so an understanding given by God. Um, and we need to, and one thing that I just think 
what Kevin said when it was like, um, there is love, there is redemption, Amen. there's grace, and there is Amen. mercy. Um, and I just hope that each of us this week and in our lives, this year and the year that we've had in terms of the pandemic, that we allow Jesus to really reveal to us who he is and yeah. his characters. And that if you're feeling lost, there is hope. And if you're feeling rejected, there is redemption. There's always a chance for everybody. Amen. And I just felt that we should carry that this week that we're about to begin. Amen. And before you go, I just want to say a prayer for everyone here on the line. Um, Lord, I just want to say thank you for today. Um, wherever we are right now, whether it be at church or at home or in an office, or wherever we are, Lord God, we just want to say thank you for meeting with us. Um, our hearts are open to you. We want to learn more. Um, we want to get, we want to delve into you. We want to get close to you, Lord. We want to keep us humbled, Lord God. We want the revelation as well. So I pray, Lord God, the message that was delivered today, Lord God, from you through Pastor Kevin, Lord God. I pray it will resonate in our hearts and in our minds and forever, not just for today, not just for tomorrow, Lord God, not for just the week ahead, but forever, Lord God. And we're always seeking to get close to you. But Lord God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Um, for those I can't see right now that's online, I pray, Lord God, that you encourage them. I pray they will fill your spirit, Lord God, in that home and that office place, Lord. You will surround them, Lord, surround us, surround Rivi, Lord God. Um, I just want to say thank you again for this moment, Lord God, where we could come together, Lord God. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday, BCC. Bless you, BCC. Bless you.